people can attest to this. Like my weight doesn't change a whole lot. Mm. My body composition will change. Uh, um, but I don't really get too much. I'm around a 155, 156. You know, oh. that's that's kind of like my walking around. I rarely break 160. Uh, Ungoogleable stories of the human experience. Guys, that's professional boxer and a former WBO welterweight world champion, Chris Algieri. This video is Chris sharing with us his systems and his insights on the topic of weight cutting within professional combat sports, specifically boxing and MMA. Chris isn't only a fighter, he's also a professional nutritionist and some of his clients are guys such as perennial world title contender Danny Jacobs. Algeri's fought the likes of the world's best with huge names such as Amir Khan, Ruslan Provotnikov, Manny Pacquiao, and Errol Spence Jr. If you want to watch the rest in the entire video of my interview with Chris Algeri, click the link in the show notes. Also, check out other interviews I've done with former world champions and fighters such as Stipe Miocic, Carlos Condit, Evander Holyfield, and Larry Holmes. All of those interviews and podcasts can be found in the link in the bio on my YouTube channel or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts at. Search ungoogleable and you know, hit subscribe. I'm fighting at 140, how, at this stage in your career, how heavy will you get? Like, where is your comfort level at walking around at knowing that you have to cut this much weight? You know, the funny thing is, and, 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 uh, and, and Dr. Peacock will can attest to this, like, my weight doesn't change a whole lot. Mm. My body composition will change. Uh, um, but I don't really get too much. I'm around a 155, 156. You know, oh. that's that's kind of like my walking around. I rarely break 160. Um, you know, I, I, I live pretty lean. I walk around pretty lean. Even even oh, at I, my higher body fat, body fat percentages, I'm still you know between eight and a half and ten percent you know body fat. Um, so that's but that's just my body type. You know, that's just kind of the way that I, that 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 I am. And not everybody can do that. And I understand that. Um, and I have to take that into account when I work with with other athletes. But, um, yeah, the weight, I mean, the weight's always hard <laughs> at the highest mm -hmm. level, you know, even though it's only 15 pounds away, it's still hard for me. Cause like I said, I walk around lean. So, you know, making one forty is definitely not easy, but even when I fought at 47, it, it, it was definitely easier, mm -hmm. but you, you kind of have to build your body up in order to, to be in the weight class, you know? And I think if you understand nutrition and training and your own body, you know, the human body's plastic, you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, I like that. So when you're at 155 and you're do and you're drilling, is it more than just speed that you're noticing personally when you're doing your drills, or is there a psychological component knowing that because your speed, man, and your your precision. When I watch mm -hmm. you fight, you know, I picked up boxing when I was a kid. When I was seven, my dad had me doing it with Pavlik. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, Kelly, Scott, yeah, Kelly's a good friend. He told me to tell you what's up. By the way, uh, he's awesome, man. Such a good dude. I've been a, I was on a podcast a while ago. Yeah. And so when I was 30, I was researching about, you know, my family has a degenerative brain disease, um, Alzheimer's. And so there was this mm. research about neuroplasticity and doing things ambidextrously to rewire these different parts of the brain. So I started yep. hitting the heavy bag again. And when I watch you or guys like Lomachenko, I see that. I'm like, shit, I'm never going to hit the heavy bag again. This is terrible. Man, I've seen your videos. <laughs> you, you, I've seen your videos. You're getting better and better. Uh, so keep keep but, going. It's like a human video game, man. And, and I'm, I'm noticing that as I drop weight, because I started at like a good 89 and I'm down 89 kilos and I'm down about 82. Mm -hmm. I noticed the biggest difference for me is the speed thing. So I can only imagine a guy like you who is fine tuned top of the food chain. Are you noticing a speed difference between pounds, between kilos? Is that why, is that why we want, you want to get down to that specific weight? Or is it strictly because that's where the weight class is? No, no, it's, it, it's, it's what you said. Like that's, that's where my body feels and performs best. It's, mm -hmm. and it's very, very tight. Um, it's a very, very tight range. It's a couple pounds. Yeah. Like I know around the, around the, between the 54 and 56 range, you know, I feel, I feel really good. I feel, and it's not just speed, you know, it's, it's, it's the way your body feels, yeah. you know, it's the way like where your elbows sit in your, in your boxing stance. Um, you know, how you feel on your heels when you sit down. Um, how, you know, how your head movement moves when you're, when you're rolling and slipping and, and, and it's just, you know, you have a, yep, yeah, yeah, that's, that's your body type. That's, that's, it's a high performance vehicle and every ounce counts. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with, with fighters who guys who, who cut a ton of weight and, 
you know, they'll spend the majority of their camp, say, for example, they're, I don't know, like a 155er in, in, in MMA. And maybe the guy spends the majority of his camp at, you know, 175, right? And, and then he cuts down to 155, and then on fight night, he's 165. He's a different performance vehicle than he was during his camp. You know, that 10 pounds, it, maybe he's faster, but he might not have the control at that, at that, at that body. You know, mm. he doesn't know that body the way he knows the 175 pound body. Or I've had guys do the exact opposite where they've, they spend the majority of their camp at 65 and then on fight night at 175. Now you're a bigger, slower, plotting guy. You don't know that body. You're not reacting the same way. And at the highest level, that makes a magnificent difference in, in, yeah. in how you perform. And what better guy to learn from than somebody who's in it, especially when we're talking about weight cuts and combat sports. And it's one of the things and one of the reasons why I love reaching out to professional fighters and learning these topics firsthand from these guys and girls. Now guys, weight cutting is a very controversial topic and issue, not only in boxing, but in all combat sports. My bread and butter regarding the interviews lie within MMA. A lot of UFC fighters have been on the show. If you follow me, you know who I've interviewed. Just search the interviews below, but also in boxing. And what we see in a lot of these fighters when we're talking, now we're talking, I'm coming from an intentions of injuries, brain trauma. Now, Chris and I didn't speak about that specifically in this chat. Just stay tuned for another video I'll do and we'll get into that. But I wanna tell you guys my intentions on posting this video and opening the door about the weight cuts and the controversy. So here we go. When you see, we'll talk about boxing. When you see fighters who, after the fight ends and they collapse or they get hospitalized, unfortunately, some fighters have died in the past and some fighters are never the same. There's some hugely famous instances. I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio in the early 80s. We had a world champion named Ray Boom Boom Mancini and he fought that infamous fight in 19, I think it was 82 or 80, in the outdoor heat of Las Vegas. And he fought a champion named Dooku Kim. And this fight changed sports history forever, specifically boxing, because at that time, Boxing wasn't a 12 round affair, it went 15 rounds. Because of that fight, it was a back and forth war, it could have gone either way. After the 15th round, Dooku Kim, Mancini's opponent, never got off the stool. He was then immediately rushed to the hospital and a few days later he was pronounced dead. Now, that fight put into motion some rule changes. One of those rules where we learn that it's not the wisest thing to fight outdoors in the desert heat on a Saturday afternoon. That should have been common sense. Another thing was the duration of the event. It went 15 rounds. So that's why we see professional fights at the highest level, 12 rounds. It didn't change instantly, but over time because of that fight, boxing went from 15 to 12 rounds, shortening the time spent in combat. Now, one of the components where I feel that the sport could also make another jump in the right direction, all combat sports, is the weight cutting component. I'm a fan, and I'm not a proponent of doing away with the weight cuts altogether, but creating a better system so you're not having these instances like starving yourselves just for the day of the weigh-in and then refilling for the night of the fight. And why that's important is because when you have guys dehydrating themselves, it's not just the body and the muscles that is water starved, it's also the brain. The brain has fluid that protects it from trauma. So when we're cutting weight and we're in a state of dehydration, which what weight cutting is, you lose that cerebral fluid around the brain, that protection around the brain. And in a sport like boxing, which is so many shots getting peppered, this is what causes a lot of these traumatic instances and when fighters lose their lives. It's very rarely that you see it happen when a big puncher knocks a guy out and then the fighter dies. Due to accumulation, the big puncher versus the volume puncher, the volume puncher that's a more dangerous fight for a fighter because he's taking more shots and depending on how much weight he cut, he's way more susceptible to traumatic brain injuries and a horrific event like losing your life, like what happened to Dooku Kim. Mancini was a big puncher, but it was a, it was a volume of, it was, it was an accumulation of things. Accumulation of the punches, it was a war, but also the weight cut and then other variables, the dehydration, they also fought outdoors in the desert heat. What we want to do here is 
Another example of this is the Nigel Benn fight in the 90s versus Gerald McClellan. McClellan was a knockout artist. And if you go back to that fight, if you guys aren't boxing historians or boxing buffs, what I don't expect you to be, go research that fight. McClellan was an American. He fought a Brit champion. They're both knockout artists. McClellan was the favorite. And in the first round, he knocks Ben through the ropes. What happened next, though, McClellan cuts a bunch of weight to make the middleweight weight class, 160. The night of the, and he's a knockout artist. The night of the fight, he's dehydrated, as he is in his all, fight, all fights, <clears throat> and he empties the tank in the first round, and you can see it. Any other fighter other than Nigel Ben would have been finished. Ben gets knocked through the ropes, but he doesn't quit. He withstands the 10 count, battles back, and then ends up going, I think it was in the ninth or the 10th round. Let me check that out real quick. The point is, McClellan was gassed, he ended up taking so much damage and he got knocked out and he and he was never it, it's he was never the same guy he like he's paraplegic and I'm looking at the Wikipedia page it's it, it's yeah he was a two-time middleweight champion um, and he's in a wheelchair as we speak he, he, he was never it took he was brain basically brain dead I mean he could slur a little bit of his words but this guy went from one of the most feared punchers of all time to having a major brain injury, a traumatic brain injury. And a lot of it had to do, and I'm reading his Wikipedia, was a blood clot on the brain due to weight cut. He had to have emergency surgery, was put into a coma, and suffered extensive brain, brain damage. When we go into a coma, a coma, the brain is then starved of oxygen, and then atrophy begins to occur, and basically the death of cells. And this is what causes brain damage. It's when you have drowning victims or somebody who has a heart attack, you want to perform CPR as soon as possible because the more time spent starved of oxygen, the more brain cells that, that, that die. And a lot of people say McClellan walked around at 190 pounds and he cut down a middleweight, which was 160 pounds. And it doesn't, ha I mean, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Guys get brain damage, guys die. And I think, like I said earlier, a great kind of push forward would be maybe implementing either a percentage of body f weight that you're allowed to lose before the fight or just weigh in on a fight day so you're not going and starved. If you fight at 160, uh, you got to weigh in and then you have to fight that day rather than giving the 24-hour rule, which boxing and MMA both do. I think that it will, this could um, just save a lot of injuries and save a lot of careers and maybe prolong certain careers because it's those headshots, those volume punchers that do the most damage over time. And depending on a guy, how much weight they cut, man, you're just, you're literally playing with fire here. Now, I've, I've talked to some fighters, they're, not, they're on board with it. It just is really a tale of two different stories. Like Chris only cuts 15 pounds, but I've talked to guys who cut 40. You look at a guy like Chris Fott, Errol Spence Jr., he walks around, he walks around at 190. And he cut down, I think him and Chris fought at 147. That's a huge, and he's, I mean, he's young, he's in his 20s now, he might be 29, 30, he could get away with it. But the older you get, that does havoc on your thyroid. So there's a thing called hypo and hyperthyroidism. Basically, the organ within our body that helps regulate weight gain and weight loss. And if you're a fighter and you have 40 pro fights, um, disregard your, you know, not even including your amateur career, that means 40 different times in your life you had to cut weight and put it on. What that does, that weight loss and weight gain, that fries that thyroid, that regulation system of keeping our body at a homeostasis weight. So the older you get, that's why it's not surprising when you look at professional fighters after they re retire and once they start getting older, you see them blow up or balloon out. A lot of it, one, obviously the discipline isn't there and they're not training for a fight, but two, which doesn't get spoken about enough, is that thyroid being totally fried from that whole career of cutting weight. So it's something to think about. I'd love for you guys to leave comments what your thoughts are on weight cuts. Are you for weight cuts? Are you against them? And remember guys, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more of these videos. Ungoogleable, stories of the human experience.